Future Proof is sponsored by Carrot Events, showcasing your company values with high impact bespoke events. Hello and welcome back to Future Proof. Thank you Sarah, uh, very much for joining me, Sarah Hopwood, as I continue this programme. And today I'm talking about agile working and um, activity-based learning. And in the first half, I gave a case study looking at a developer who gave a quote uh, for £10 million pounds over 20 months, um, but in that contract he had promised the client that if at any point the contract was um, terminated, then the client just needed to pay 20% on the remaining monies that were owed. And um, many people in business would think that that was bad news um, and a bad result if that happened, but the case study showed actually it was a very good win-win uh, for the customer and indeed for the developer himself. So that worked well because the developer started on high value content first and so after he had worked um, just a third of the month, I think it says here, uh, he was paid 1.5 million which was billed and the clients, the customers looked at it and they were actually ever so pleased with what the work that had been done. So they were quite happy to terminate the contract there. So that left the developer uh, more time if you like to go out and repeat uh, the business deal with somebody else but also it's a bit like um, redundancy pay if you like. He got 20% on the remaining funds and um, his uh, profit margin soared from 15% 15, 15 up to 60%. So it's a massive win-win. The customers were very, very happy because they um, had the work in a lot earlier than they thought. They had everything they need, so they were empowered. And also they didn't pay the 10 million they thought that they would be paying. The developer won because he got his money, he got 20% on the remaining funds, and then he's got time, so he's got more time in his bank uh, where he can then go now and uh, create another contract with another business where he can repeat exactly the same exercise. And why is that so good? Because not, yes, it's a win-win, but also you can tell immediately that the value system of the um, of the contractor of yes is of the developer is all about uh, their customer. He gave them the highest value that he could up front. How often do we, from even if you're preparing a professional presentation of some sort, people so often try and save the best till last, and it's absolutely fatal. You know, people have disengaged by then, so whatever we're doing, it should be our core values to give the best that we've got up front, and that also shows that we are our priority is that the customer gets what they want and we're not trying to selfishly hang on, if you like, to the all about me stuff. So in the second half, I want to talk about um, uh, the Scrum and, uh, and, uh, and also the uh, Sprints. And I also want to touch on design thinking, lean startup and how that fits with Agile as well. So design thinking, and I have a definition here actually for design thinking, and it says here, um, uh, design thinking, it walks participants through proven pathways for inspiration, problem definition, idea generation, prototyping, and testing. And according to Tim Brown, author and CEO of world-renowned design consultancy IDO, he said, design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. Well, possibilities for technology, we're well into that now, aren't we, with um, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So moving on from design technology, Lean Startup is used to turn these proposed solutions into business models underpinned by assumptions that are rapidly tested with actual customers to separate truth from fiction, learn and iterate towards product market 
fit. And what I love about this sentence is the truth from fiction. And yes, I've worked with many businesses in the real world, but I've also worked in education uh, with the Young Enterprise Scheme. And for an, a few years, I think it's two or three years, I was the business advisor up at Lansing College. And it was really interesting to see the students who were able to move um, from the fiction into um, you know something that was factual, uh, particularly when they had these ideas for their businesses and they went out and tested them. And, uh, and it always showed when it came to selling, those who had actually kept it all real and factual and those who were actually um, living in something that wasn't real. So we all have to be careful when we go and test an idea and take it to the marketplace and do surveys that we aren't just going to family and friends who will nod in the right place, tell us that we're absolutely brilliant. But of course, when it comes to parting with their hard earned cash, they suddenly are less um, eager to um, separate uh, separate from that cash and indeed um, support you as you believed that they would. But those who have um, very much um, uh, looked at the truth and probably asked very intelligent questions by the way gosh you know judge a man by his questions don't underestimate that statement it's incredibly powerful the ones who knew the truth that then took their products to market absolutely soared compared to the other groups within the school because they had properly tested they would moved away from fiction um, they had um, there's a great I, I heard this years ago and, and if it's wrong Jeremy Clarkson then I apologise now, I'm just passing on something that I've heard, that apparently when he's interviewing people, he actually has a piece of paper in front of him, or used to, maybe not now, saying, why, do they, why are they lying to me? And it's not because he thinks they're liars, but it's because it makes him thoroughly test what they are saying. So he's thinking, are you telling me the truth? And when we're testing and we're going out doing our surveys, this is how we should be thinking, particularly when we're talking to family and friends, because very often they're saying and doing the right things to support you because they love you so if you actually had that thing why are they lying to me it would make you just double test it go yeah yeah, yeah mum I know you think it's great but you know if I gave you 50 units would you actually buy them is the money in the bank and that's where you turn it into a reality so um, I, I wanted to also just talk about scrums and uh, the sprint. So agile working, as I said going into the break, in my simple mind, and I'm not an expert, to me agile working is more about the principle. It's about the work ethic of being light on our feet, about being all customer focused and particularly international companies um, very much um, are, are under pressure to work um, with an agile uh, mindset because their competitors are already doing it so it means their competitors are getting things done and getting things through to their customers much much um, more speedily but also their response rate is much more speedily so they're better able to manage expectations as well as actually bring out the final product that is being purchased. So the sprints are um, breaking up the project, if you like, the job in hand, breaking it up into visible, tangible working units. So if you imagine making a car, then a sprint is breaking up those elements of making a car so that you can benchmark and double check that you are actually on target. And um, the agile thinking in that is that we have the right people in the room who are the best qualified and best able and in the best position to do the job most effectively and thoroughly for the benefit of the customer. And too many people are, you know, wearing their job titles on their chest, if you like, that um, project teams have the same old people in there. And not arguably, they're the people who've always been um, very proactive and quick and, and what have you. But what what we need to do is make sure we get the right people in the room and then motivate them to be agile and quick and thorough and responsive um, so rather than just automatically go to the same lot and at the end of each sprint we have this assessment are we where we think we are and um, what needs to change what needs to be binned what needs to be brought in and at that point, at the end of each sprint, um, then as a business, we should be stood there looking, going, right, I'll be on course, is everything as it should? And then always ask the team, 
Do we pivot? Do we slightly change and then move forward? Is this a little shift of the ladder, a shift of just, you know, even if it's substituting, a bit like a substitute on a football pitch? Um, or do we persist? Do we know that we've got it right, but we actually persist? And, and think about it, actually, that football game analysis is, is um, quite a good one. You know, if you're not winning the game, do you still believe you've got the right team on the pitch? So do you persist or do you need to pivot slightly and make a little shift and change? And the key thing there, which is all about emotional intelligence, is people should refrain from taking offence with any of these decisions that are being made. Because remember, all the time, the whole focus on is on giving value to the customer. That's where the priority lies, not the value necessary to the team member um, who is precious about their job title, anxious about this, that and the other. Yes, we should empathise and understand with them, but every single time the priority is the customer. Why? Because all your competitors are doing it and if you're not doing it, you'll lose.